Aloha, welcome to Hawaii is my mainland. Today I have two of my favorite people on the island, Hunter Hevelin and Matthew Lynch. I'm gonna just jump right in with them because we have so much fun. They were the um, people who introduced me to permaculture. I had been hearing about permaculture for about 10 years because of a landscape designer talked about it and I just couldn't really figure out what that meant. And then suddenly I found myself part of a <laughs> something called a permaculture design course, a PDC. Mm -hmm. And then uh, for the next six weeks, life was glorious, thanks to you two. <laughs> Hopefully some weeks afterwards. <laughs> yes, um, and even though we were hunched in a tent behind uh, uh, the uh, Weinberg Homeless Village in Waimanalo, um, <laughs> it was absolutely wonderful, but it's really hard to sort of describe what permaculture is. And so let's just have a little round here. What, what's your favorite definition at the moment? Matthew Lynch. Matthew Lynch, by the way, is a founder of the Asia Pacific Center for Regenerative Design. Yes, that's a mouthful. I have the other director of the Asia Pacific Center for Regenerative Design, who is Hunter Hevelin. They both um, wear too many hats for me to name them all, but I'll probably throw in a couple as we go along. Um, let's just start. What is permaculture? I was hoping you could help us answer that question, Okay, Kelly. well, since you asked, I'll give my current, my current answer is, um, and I think this is one I made up at the second time I did a PDC, the one at Green Rose, um, was that it's how to teach people born in um, modern societies to think more like indigenous people. I like that. That's interesting. Uh, What's your current definition? Well, I think it's important to point out that you have the dubious honor of having taken our course more than anyone else. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. I believe so. Okay. It's some sort of awesome. record. You're, the, you're the only one who's come back twice for the full run. We're starting a, another one. You want to take a third. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm likely to show up. <laughs> well, we look forward to it. Um, uh, I think of permaculture as a, uh, it's a design science, there's lifestyle aspects incorporated. Um, it's a, originally a portmanteau of permanent and agriculture. And so uh, some Aussies uh, a few decades ago were looking at the state of the world and were considering how they might be able to remedy some of the issues that they saw environmentally, socially and otherwise to uh, address um, and navigate social ecological systems and their management. And so by piecing together um, it very, in a very interdisciplinary manner uh, information from architecture, community development, environmental science, agriculture, forestry, and all these other um, sort of suites or silos of knowledge, they piece together a, a, an approach to design for sustainable human settlement. And so I think that's probably the, the simplest definition is that it's a design approach to sustainable human settlement. Yay, okay. I thought you were gonna say the simplest approach to uh, defining that was all of that preamble. <laughs> <laughs> it's very eloquent. It's, uh... Very eloquent. <laughs> I have to say, that's one of the great joys of taking the, the, this course is because you two um, play off each other's skills very well and just the, the vocabulary, it's like, wow, it's beautiful. <laughs> I just get off of the vocabulary. That presumes we have skills, and uh, <laughs> one of us at least has a, a stellar vocabulary, and uh, I consider myself very much a practitioner, so our constant tension of opposites tends to be this idea of uh, deep, thoughtful, <laughs> um, uh, not dissertations, but what's the... What's Elocutions. The word? Yes, uh, yes. New word for the day, um, <laughs> as opposed to my breaking it down to my simple sort of sixth grader understanding of what this might actually oh, uh, look like. <laughs> what does this mean um, we, we, from a sort of, um, how do I put this into action, into practice? And that's one of my favorite uh, uh, sort of refrains. Yeah, yeah. Refrain. Okay. So. <laughs> yeah. so my current definition, yes. um, which I feel like it's important, it is an interesting notion that we, all three of us have sort of preface this with my current definition of this, because permaculture means a lot of things to a, um, a lot of different people, um, and that perhaps is one of the most um, sort of powerful aspects of it, is that it has a very broad um, uh, sort of appeal and very low barriers to entry, right? Um, there's a flip side to that as well, um, as we found out when we visited the, was it 11th annual? 
permaculture, permaculture riot biennial, we got permacul international permaculture convergence in Cuba a couple years ago. Yes. Um, we also learned that we're perhaps the um, world's most fascinating group of organized anarchists, <laughs> yes. each seeking to you know um, make a positive impact on the world. So I just want to throw in that was 450 people from 50 different countries, eight of us from Hawaii, all because of you two. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that we can take credit for that. Uh, well, you can. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give it to you. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. It was, it, was, um, it, was, it was a fascinating trip. I mean, yes, it was a lot of fun. And to travel you know, to the other side of the world and visit another island culture um, and to uh, uh, see firsthand um, and ex also experience a very, very a vastly different social context, right? And Cuba now is even more fascinating as they come out of this sort of... Uh, you know, into the new era, whatever that looks like, right? But you were talking about how we're, there's this sort of anarchy about it. Yeah. So go back to your definition. Yeah, my, we'll thanks for reeling me back in. I need to go on a related tangent. Um, so I guess I'm going to take a stab at this. I'm just thinking out loud at this point. Um, my current thinking on permaculture is it's a sort of a, a design framework um, that uh, looks to ecolog applying ecological principles to solving problems. Um, and so I like to think of it in terms of human systems. And Hunter mentioned it, socio-ecological systems. Yeah, that's my favorite phrase. You picked that up on it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, I, my current work, my day-to-day my -day life, looks very different from um, uh, where we were <laughs> when you took the course. I was doing a lot of very sort of land-based work and a lot of sort of uh, uh, community building um, and I was uh, involved with a sort of edible landscaping company at the time and so on and so forth. So very practical, hands-on, hands-in-the-dirt type of thing. And now I find myself in an office all day, um, and I still consider myself as applying permaculture, problem-solving protocols to help solve some of the challenges that our large institutions face. Um, and so it's, it's, I find it so fascinating that here we can take this sort of framework and this approach to problem solving and apply it to multiple contexts. And I think one of the things that makes it so powerful is that it is grounded in an ethical foundation of care of earth, care of people, and the sort of fair sharing of resources. Ah, oh, thank you, Matthew, for bringing <laughs> up those three. I, I, I forget about them, but that really is the way to boil it down in its smallest. Were, were, were you guys on the bus um, that got stranded in Cuba? I can't remember. You right? Right. We were on one of the buses that got the bus stranded. Got Which stranded? bus that got stranded? <laughs> when? <laughs> <laughs> when we were trying to figure out, you know, how we were going to get back to, to Havana, and then there was a, 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 an impromptu group. Okay, so... Um, this isn't working. Um, how do we, as permaculturists, address this problem? And um, leaders spontaneously emerged, uh, willing to take the initiative. I think a couple of uh, really wonderful women from California, <laughs> and um, managed to get the new bust ordered, and it came. But there was the, the process of that was mind-bogglingly compassionate mm -hmm. and humane and respectful and I thought wow this is the first I'm really seeing uh, social permaculture in action and I think that's um, in my mind that sort of represents one of the sort of highest and best examples of what this looks like when it's um, expressed you know and it, and it achieves its highest and fullest potential um, and I think you know one of the sort of um, uh, guiding principles of permaculture is sort of to apply, um, uh, so help me out here, <laughs> just self-regulation, mm -hmm. observe, apply, accept feedback, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you trying to say? Yeah, no, yeah. Accept feedback and apply. We have a course starting right? soon. Right, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and, and so the uh, point I'm attempting to make very clumsily um, is this idea of being sort of self-critical and taking a step out and seeing like what works, what's great about this that works, and also what the, what's, doesn't work so great, and how can we course correct so that we can be a learning um, organization of sort of practitioners, right? And so that we can, again, uh, maximize our positive impact on our, on our planet and our communities, right? Hunter, I'm glad you mentioned that um, all this exciting stuff we're talking about that, that there will soon be a very 
excellent opportunity yep. for uh, others to join in. Um, let's just pop that out. When, when where? So how? we will be running our ninth course on Oahu, uh, and this is a, a format for this or for all permaculture design uh, courses is 72 hours of contact time with uh, teachers and instructors, various backgrounds and understandings. Uh, the way that we've structured this course is specifically for folks that live on Oahu. And so each weekend, one weekend per month, we're in a different moku, a different part of the island, visiting farms and projects and um, getting to hear from people who have been practitioners for, in some cases, many years, and some folks who are just, um, you know, fully diving in. Uh, and so it's a really opp good opportunity to, to experience not only the breadth of, of programming that's happening on Oahu that utilizes permaculture as a framework for what they do in one way or another, um, but also just an opportunity to learn a lot about sustainable agriculture and to see what different communities are doing to organize themselves to address the issues that they've identified in their communities, whether it be environmental quality or social justice or um, you know, even just economic viability. And so it's, it's a really spectacular opportunity and for folks from this island, um, or of this island, to um, really dive into a lot of other parts of the island that I think most haven't really had a chance to, it's, to see It's a lot shocking of that we live on this relatively small island and how many people do not get out of their moku or out, out of a couple of them. Um, I uh, uh, <laughs> have found a couple discovered new nooks and crannies of Oahu. I, I think I, I've you know, seen most of them, but um, I got to discover some of the really... Um, Which was, what, what were some of the discoveries for you? You know, um, I, I, I think of it as Shangri-La. Um, it, it makes me weep Where to walk up on, on the ground. <laughs> it does. It, the, the rapoons. Oh, got you. <laughs> um, and uh, the rapoons farm, they're, they're mm -hmm. one of the... Um, I, I think they're, it's the... the uh, example of um, functional community centered um, regenerative I mean I, it's just so beautiful literally it, it, it moves me to tears to be there and, and to talk to them and it's well worth the course just to go there, just to go <laughs> <laughs> thanks for the glowing endorsement it is certainly a highlight for but you have no idea how beautiful uh, yeah. Waiholi is when you drive by you know, it just looks kind of swampy and dense and whatever. And you get to the rapoons, and it's it's rolling hills, and it's um, manicured, but organically laid out, and everything is 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 purpose. I mean, there's there's you can see that there was really design and thought into it, and they weren't. They didn't set it up as a permaculture place. No, they weren't, they weren't utilizing permaculture as a framework, but they just threw uh, a great command of intellect and a very much willful uh, adventuring uh, and exploratory spirit found what worked for that piece of land. And I think what you had said about you know, finding that area beautiful is that it, it really offers up a notion of what agriculture can be and how it can function, right? Is that we're, we oftentimes now, I think, think of agriculture as almost akin to like an industrial environment, um, or at least an industrial management of the, of right. the environment. Right. And so permaculture, in many of the ways it's applied to land in particular, provides um, through the sort of suite of agroecological practices or sustainable agriculture or whatnot, a mechanism that we can actually start shifting not just how we conceptualize what it takes to produce or to wrest what we need from the earth, but that we can actually do so in a, in a manner that's benefiting um, the earth that we're, you know, being provided from, as well as is, is just aesthetically, you know, beautiful and, and creates a space that one would like to be in. Um, and so, yeah, I, I wholly agree. I've loitered on their farm for many years, <laughs> um, gleaning what I can. But so we're going to take a little a little break now, and then come back and and show some pictures of the rapids. All right. Aloha, my name is Justina Spiritu and I'm the co-host of Hawaii Farmers Series. This is my co-host, Matthew Johnson, and you can catch us every Thursday at 4 p.m. at thinktechhawaii.com. What do we talk about, Matt? So on Hawaii Farmers Series, we're going to be bringing on the farmers and also supporter of farmers. 
including restaurants, caterers, as well as government supporters and nonprofits to hear their background stories and understanding our local ag community just a little bit better. Yeah, essentially there's a lot more that goes into farming and the local food community beyond just producing the food. And we want to feature and get the background story on all these folks and see how we all work together as a community. So join us every Thursday. Aloha. Welcome back to Hawaii is my mainland. I'm Kaui Lucas and today I have permaculture instructors Matt Lynch and Hunter Hevelin. And we were just talking about um, their permaculture design course, which is a, a course that is taught all over the world. And it has a standard format, but it's very varied, <laughs> uh, depending on, on where and who teaches it. Um, and uh, the upcoming course, which starts at the end of January? January 23rd, 24th. OK. Um, we'll be going from, to different sites around Oahu. And I did that course two years ago. And there's a few pictures that we'd like to see um, slowly. And we'll kind of talk about, oh, this is the Blitz series. Well, let's not speak it. <laughs> Where is this? This is oh, it's in mixed up. Well, rise. Um, yeah, this, is, um, this is the end result of a permaculture design course project we did for your um, uh, Barbara. Barbara. Mm -hmm. So this each each uh, permaculture design course, the students are broken up into groups, and one of the um, final design tasks is to actually create a, a landscape and other uh, design aspects for a particular site. So this was one of them up in Wilhelmina Rise, which is a home site. Right, and so what we're looking at here is uh, some very happy, we refer to blitzers. The reason why it's a, they're, they're blitzers is because in a single day, um, a group of rabid volunteers will show up at a predetermined location uh, to essentially transform that landscape into a foodscape in the course of that day. And the design um, sort of discipline that informs that is permaculture design. So going from uh, sort of high input um, or unmanaged landscapes to highly productive, um, ideally uh, low, at low input or at least lower input um, uh, landscapes. So, so yeah. I have a great follow-up yeah. story for this. Um, at that, um, so just to clarify, there's the permaculture design course and then there's permablitz. There are two different things. This was a, uh, that was a picture taken at a permablitz, the design for which was done during my permaculture design course. and. Um, during that permablitz, um, a couple thousand pounds of invasive lemu suddenly became available. <laughs> and um, that uh, we put <coughs> it up there and put it down where those. The and um, I heard from the homeowner that after not bearing fruit for a decade or, or since she, she moved there, um, after that luscious carpet. Mm of invasive lemu, she had not one but two crops from those mango trees. Oh, I so I think that's like a yay story for, yeah, for lemu it, and permablitz. Right, it's a great <laughs> example or sort of expression of these sort of permaculture principles, right? And this idea of that nothing is wasted, and waste, th rethinking of waste as a resource. And so you have something that when, it, uh, when it's put out of place is, is noxious and is a problem. However, can we put this somewhere else where it can become, you know, a protecting for the soil, um, and also provide, you know, nutrients and inputs? And it's interesting too that you got the uh, it, it catalyzed the bumper crop. <laughs> right, and that that lima was um, uh, taken from a, a community group at my church, and I just happened to be the connection point because I've been instructed by you, and and okay, we have an input. Let's let's put it to use and. That kind of thing tends to happen when you get into permaculture <laughs> circles. Uh, what are we oh, looking at here? Ah, uh, this is it. This is the design exercise number one at Wahuena Farm oh, yeah. at mm -hmm. um, that beautiful spot uh, on the North Shore near um, Sunset. And that very that's the back of there. your head, Matt. There we go. Um, design exercise. So tell us about design exercise number one, what happens. What a good looking head that is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is the student's first um, sort of exposure to actually implementing some of the design principles. 
Um, and so we'll make up a sort of a fictitious design brief, and um, in a very, in the space of an afternoon, um, uh, they have an experience of interacting with various clients <laughs> and on the various <laughs> sites. <laughs> Uh, we won't we won't spoil any no. not spoilers there. No. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, the groups take turns um, presenting what they've come up with. So they're responding to they each actually have the, the they're designing on the same physical site, but they have three different sort of client profiles. And what emerges is when you designed in response to what the land offers and also to what the user um, is looking to how they're looking to interact with the land three very different designs often um, will consistently emerge because um, permaculture is about designing in response to the conditions that are there, about taking what's available um, and using it to enhance um, the quality of life of the occupants. It's a, 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 a mesh of uh, psychology <laughs> of, of the client and then the environment. So there's that social environmental thing. Well, there's the psychology of the client, but there's also, I mean, be addressing what skill sets, what time availability, what degree of interest or um, funds or whatever various resources they may have on hand um, that, that really factor into how that landscape could be managed and then how they'd like it to be managed. And then that informs by the relatively more static um, environmental uh, inputs or, or considerations, whether that's their rainfall or their soil type or whatnot um, really sets the foundation for, for good design. Yeah. So this, uh, this is one of the uh, exercises that we do early on in the course. Um, this is at the Rapoons, by the way. There you go. Uh, that's their processing facility behind their cocoa, uh, cocoa, cacao and coffee drying up there in the, on the right hand, left hand side of the screen. There's their poi processing factory behind there. And the students are, are tugging on this string um, to explore the interconnectedity of problems and how they impact each other. Um, and especially in today's context, um, how uh, the nature of the challenges that we're facing uh, require interconnected solutions and this design thinking approach. Um, and so another thing I'd like to point out here is that um, part of the teaching format of the course is we'll present these concepts uh, that we can sort of talk through and think through intellectually. Um, and then we'll work to give a practical experience of what those concepts are so that uh, we can engage multiple learning styles and that so you can leave with a sort of really embedded um, uh, understanding of these concepts. Yeah, this one, oh, here we are back at the Blitz. I don't think you guys have ever seen this picture, have you? That's adorable. Oh, isn't it? I call them the Blitz kids. They were just so, and they're, um, this was, again, the, the, the final implementation at Barbara's, um, at, at the Permablitz. And one of the great community building things about Permablitzes is, is that uh, there always seems to be kids and animals. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> although I guess that's true of the, of the permaculture design course, although fewer children. But there, there always more animals. more animals, right. lots of, usually, usually <laughs> goats. Right, right. <laughs> Has there ever been a PDC without goats? That's a good question. Mm. Not, not as of yet, to my knowledge. It sort of goes hand in hand with it. Oh, here's oh. a happy camp. This is our first course that we taught. Yes, I wasn't in Yeah, that, and that's yeah, in uh, look at that. uh, where, where was Waimanalo. That? That's the final weekend. It's really a diverse group of people there. There's farmers, there are teachers, there's researchers, community activists, businessmen, um, all types yeah. of people drawn together by a common desire to want to go out and maximize their positive impact on the world. Yeah. Oh, that's your group. Where are you, Cowie? <laughs> I am uh, next to uh, da Davi. There you are. Yep. Yeah. And, is, that a, is that a senator? That is there? a senator. Wow. Look, it's Mike Gabbard. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. All sorts of characters showing All up. Look, there's a CEO on the other side. Yeah. CEO down to earth. That's right. That was our graduation. Yeah. That's why. Uh, Musicians, Dave. farmers, <laughs> activists. <laughs> uh, uh, all kinds, and that is another one of the, oh yes, Stuart Scott, who's been uh, uh, wearing the hat. Aww. Yeah. This is, yeah. This Yet the, another animal. At the at, YNR Arboretum, having found y some wildlife. Yeah. Yeah, that's, a, that's another awesome spot that few, too few people go to. 
It's a good good picture of a creature perched on the finger of an animal. <laughs> um, <laughs> so t uh, maybe you can talk a little bit more um, about the the, the themes, um, uh, some of the subject matter that gets covered in the. Yeah. So f just for as a quick example, at the arboretum, we utilize their you know wide variety of tree species and other plant species that have been brought in or that are cultivated there uh, to be a, a sort of hands-on platform for exploring base, really basic botany information about plant families, about um, different uh, growth forms or habits of particular species. People often get to you know, see how you know, one fruit grows compared to another and flower patterns, as well as looking at the structure of different forestry systems um, as a mechanism to learn about agroforestry or as it's been more popularized of late of, say, food forests. Um, and so that's a, a really neat resource um, right there in the back of Manoa Valley. But that's really what we try and do with every place that we visit is to create uh, or to tether our curriculum to the particular um, aspects of that site that are most uh, akin to you know what we're what we're trying to get across in that particular day. Oh, um, young man. Oh, that's when. Okay. <laughs> So, and uh, this, yeah. I think, Can this you one. Put poop up on the TV like that. I did. So this was this was sort of just a general. If you can't uh, handle hearing that word, don't take a PVC. <laughs> what are you What are you teaching here, Hunter? So here we're talking about different types of wastewater and their um, constituents, and then subsequently we're, we're discussing their management, and so separating out from just a singular uh, consolidated wastewater into different types of wastewater, whether it be gray water um, or uh, black water, uh, which. Yeah, uh, and then a little bit about some of the, the ways of dealing with it by um, understanding the differential biological oxygen demand and how if we're trying to reduce pathogens or sediments in uh, a particular wastewater, the, the various things that we can do. And by the way, uh, speaking of uh, two PDCs, I think we have someone that has actually come to three of Hunter's wastewater lectures because that is uh, at least three, actually. You might even come to more. <laughs> that is consistently, um, the consistent feedback is that is one of the highlights of the course. And it is highly entertaining. I always look forward to Hunter's lecture on wastewater. It is magnificent. That um, one's a little harder to do hands on. So, <laughs> yes, um, but you, you, despite the challenges, you are masterful <laughs> at it. I, I keep threatening to video it, but I think that would be somewhat of a plot spoiler. <laughs> uh, it, might, it, might, it might dampen the, the, the spontaneity of the discourse. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, and um, I think we'll take a break right now and then talk about some other projects. Sounds great. Sounds great. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute and host on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Here in Hawaii, with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the, the basis of what's right and what's good and what's going to serve the common good. And that's what we try to do at Ehana Kako. Every week we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business, and other sectors of society to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you every Monday, 2 to 3 p.m., on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. Aloha. Oh, let's throw, let's throw them up. Yeah. Uh, welcome back. I'm Kaui Lucas. This is Hawaii is my mainland. And I have Matt Lynch and Hunter Hevelin, my permaculture instructors. And um, they are both dizzyingly uh, busy in this community doing a really amazing array of projects. Um, all of them, I think, uh, have some connection to permaculture, loosely. <laughs> Um, uh, but because the PDC is coming up, I'd like you to give some more of the practical information and let's, let's make sure that that gets out there. And then maybe talk about, um, each of you maybe talk about um, some of the um, projects that you have coming up besides the PDC. Sure. 
So in terms of our, our course, you can visit our website, the apcrd.org, and that has more of the information about all the different weekends, um, some of what we cover, and general, general information about that. Um, also a link to register. Yeah. That's the only platform that we have at, at current for don't where, judge us based where, on the strength of our website, all of our please. <laughs> um. So if, if, if you can't remember that APCRD, whatever, um, I do do a follow-up uh, blog entry, uh, kawilucas.com, with links. So it'll be yeah. there. And then the mm -hmm. format of the course, it's one weekend a month over the next six months, um, which is lovely because we spend each weekend in a different part of the island. And it also gives students um, time to unpack is a weekend tends to be very information dense. Um, and then that sort of expanded time horizon, typically they're taught very intensively in a two week burst, which is the first way I think you experienced it. Actually, I had, it, I had that off one, that, the leaf, the leaf uh, one. Yeah, that it was two days, two days a, a week, week. Okay. for six weeks, which was also intense, but a nice balance. Yeah, so imagine that experience and sort of unpacked over six months. And that gives us the luxury as instructors to assign homework. <laughs> Um, which uh, is, is really neat because it allows students to um, follow whatever tangents interest them relative to the subject matter that was taught each weekend. Um, and what's really fascinating to me is um, we like to hope to impart some value in terms of our knowledge and experience. Um, the groups are so diverse that when the connections start to be made between the groups, it's amazing to see how intelligent these groups become and then really heartening to see them go out back into the world, into the communities, and to start to apply this in their daily lives. It would be hard to, um, to quantify the impact that um, attending a PDC had for me. I mean, not just going to Cuba. <laughs> And being funded to go to Cuba, that was another miracle. I mean, miracles happen. But at the end of the first PDC, that there's um, well, the very fun thing that happens at the end. Maybe we won't talk about that event. Let's just say it's a lot of fun. Okay, it's <laughs> really a lot. Of fun. <laughs> um, uh, uh, but there's a uh, there's a point where we go around and, and 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 talk about what we want moving forward in our lives, and I. And I articulated that I, I, I wanted a, to be in a, a, a little house on the periphery. And I think within three months of completing that PDC, I found it. I'm living off the grid in a little house on the periphery of suburbia. Um, not too tough, really sweet. You've done uh, well. Three years, <laughs> I'm still there, which is almost a record for me. It's really That's really right. interesting. The course actually, it, it's empirically proven makes dreams come true. <laughs> um, <so. laughs> it's really fascinating to me to see where people wind up with this. I mean, I completed my course and then uh, within 12 months found myself wandering the steppe of Mongolia with my teacher. Um, and that has led to um, a whole uh, series of other adventures in international uh, aid and development and working in multiple places. I've, I've got myself caught in a Category 5 cyclone last year, uh, deployed right. on a, a sort of permaculture-based yep. uh, consultancy. Was. That was in the South Pacific, so in Vanuatu, um, and was really uh, uh, quite hairy. Um, I think what was most jolting um, was coming back to our island and having just gone through this experience and seeing what doesn't work and what gets blown over in that those types uh, of winds. Uh -huh. And for example, driving down Klanianoli Highway and just um, trying to uh, understand what that would, might look like after a Cat 5 rode through, um, you know, I promptly enrolled myself uh, in the sort of uh, neighborhood preparedness <laughs> group um, uh, after that experience. Um, because, you know, we, we, we've just survived the sort of uh, most tropical records on, on record, most tropical storms on record in a single season last year. Um, and so because we live in... Um, uh, such a highly urbanized environment and for many of us our food security is dependent upon our ability to get to Foodland or Safeway or Costco or whatnot. Um, <laughs> yeah, we are, right, so often we don't feel firsthand as acutely the effects of climate change and the impacts that that has but when you are on a daily basis engaged in your subsistence in growing the food to feed yourself literally um, you feel those impacts firsthand um, and so that's what's great about those opportunities that are afforded 
um, to me to go out and work with these types of communities. Um, and it's a reciprocal learning. So I'm able to, there's a lot of things that we do really well here in Hawaii. Our community-based natural resource management um, work with communities is, is incredibly robust and has a lot to offer to the world. Um, and it's that type of direct knowledge export that I get to bring to these communities. And then there are, are very practical strategies that I learn on the ground every single time we get to go out into the field that have application here. It could be something as simple as a new guild or a new sort of uh, a growing, guild. a new guild of, of plants that Thank you. <laughs> um, sort of mutually enhance each other um, through their supporting functions or whatnot. Um, we discovered an edible hedge um, that looks very much like Panax, um, which you see almost ubiquitously right. see throughout the island, and um, managed to locate a specimen in a botanical garden here that nobody knew was edible, but is, um, was actually part of our food security strategy um, post-Cyclone Pam. <laughs> we went out to our hedge, literally, and picked uh, our wow. meal for the day. So, yeah, it's really, really... Um, uh, and, you know, I'm just sharing sort of like the world that has opened yeah. to me after, um, and it's fascinating to catch up to, with um, sort of other permaculture design course graduates from all over the world and to learn of the type of work that they're engaged in and to, to hear how this problem-solving protocol and this ethical framework has supported them to go out and enhance the quality of their life in their pursuit to contribute meaningfully to the world. Hunter, you've done some disaster management yourself, haven't you? Actually, you're a card carrier. I just call it living. But, <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I, I was part of some uh, response work in Haiti there where a team of permaculture folks from uh, actually around the world were brought down to focus mostly on human and solid waste management in unsanctioned uh, camps for internally displaced persons. And so I had the opportunity also to go back a few times and work on a variety of other projects with different communities. And yeah, so it's been a, a pretty, the world is, has it opened up, I guess I would say, as well. What do you, any, um, besides the PDC, anything you, um, special you're working on uh, here in Honolulu you'd like to weave into the conversation? <laughs> um, yeah, there's no shortage of projects. Yeah. Um, at Current, I'm working with a, a friend uh, who has a, s established an online platform called FarmLink Hawaii that is working to connect different buyer or producers rather and local buyers of farm fresh produce. So trying to help uh, codify and tease out from buyers what it is they're actually seeking and what their price points are and so there can actually be a, a, a meshing of supply and demand. So that we now are in the, in the position where some of the sellers are, are growing directly for some purchasers. Um, and it's, it's mediated through an online platform, so it simplifies delivery and all these other mechanisms that often add to the, the labor of either the sales from the producer end or the acquisition from the buyer end. And so it's really trying to streamline some of that. So that would sort of come under the heading of social permaculture, would it? Or I think to some degree. I mean, the, the, the broader aspect that we've just started discussing with it um, that I'm particularly excited about. I mean, just the sales mechanisms is great, but um, I, for many years I've had this kind of thought that it would be magnificent to have a farmer-owned cooperative that does a lot of the marketing uh, for various farmers that could conceivably be operated by someone who's not farming because it is a fair amount of work in itself, or it's a considerable amount of work, right? There, there have been attempts. And so the, the thought being that if we can establish this, um, mechanism, this platform that is working with a variety of producers, and then see what can be done to actually transition it into their, their hands. I think maybe we finally have a technology uh, that's accessible broadly enough that it, it, it really works. Yeah, maybe five years ago it was a little tougher. Not everybody had a smartphone. Um, but the FarmLink uh, is a, seems to be a, um, a really good way of um, making that connect. I'm glad to hear that there's uh, the idea of that a co-op amongst the farmers behind that or part of that? Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is that when we talk about the, the interest in local food or food security, that there's a lot of uh, gray space and that we don't have uh, the best data about, you know, what our food imports are, what our actual food consumption is, and then if we're going to take a, a strategic approach to increasing our, you know, say, food security or our food self-sufficiency, uh, which I, I do feel would be quite different, um, that we have to have uh, 
a mechanism that allows a, a discussion to happen that's not laborious and that's not um, a headache for you know producers to say this is what I this is what I want and uh, or rather buyers to say this is what I want and producers to say this is what I have and for there to be an interplay a discussion of sort through the market um, for that to happen so it's 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 really exciting to be a part of that. So how, um, because you're one of the other hats you wear is the UH um, Sustainability Coordinator, um, I saw that uh, Hilo is now um, serving locally sourced um, produce at uh, the UH Hilo campus. How, how are we doing in Manoa? Well, first of all, I had nothing to do with Hilo. They did that all okay. on their own. Okay. <laughs> so okay. kudos okay. to, and, and there's a lot of really great work that's being um, done across the system. Um, and at Manoa, we have work to do. Um, uh, it's a very complex organism, the university, um, and the sustainability initiative there is very much a, a startup. Um, this year is going to be a big year for us. Um, we have the upcoming uh, fourth annual sustainability uh, in higher education in Hawaii summit. Uh, it happens March 10th, 11th, and 12th um, at the East West Center on campus. Um, and this is a one time of year that we can bring together sustainability practitioners um, from students, staff, faculty, and community to um, share best practices, um, share knowledge, become smarter as an organization distributed out across our islands, um, and to advance our strategic priorities. So um, this year, uh, the four tracks that we're focusing on is student leadership, um, there's facilities management capacity building, uh, so some sort of technical training there for facilities folk. Um, uh, there is sustainability curriculum coordination group that's working on some um, really great things. We've got the sustainable science management program out at UH Maui College, um, and West Oahu just launched their Bachelor of Applied Science in Sustainable Community Food Systems um, in the fall wow. of last year, wow. which is a very robust program. Dr. Alpi Miles is heading that up. Oh, wow. Um, Do you if know I, how if many I, students? Gosh, I know. It's just started. I mean, I, if, if uh, I would qualify to get into that course, <laughs> I would love to um, take, actually take the course. Um, um. And so, uh, yeah, we've, do you want to... So, pause there and talk to the, the picture. Yeah, or, so yeah. just in wrapping up, this is another uh, another permutation of, of the Perma Blitz. It's the Surf Blitz. And um, uh, this sort of reminded me of what we saw in Cuba, actually. Um, this one, I was on the North Shore, and I wasn't mm -hmm. part of this. But there, there's um, also Surf Blitzes happening, which so, is a combination. Yeah, Surf Blitz is our partnership with the Surf Rider Foundation's Oahu chapter. And so we've been uh, fortunate enough to coordinate with them. They had a pre-existing program called uh, Ocean Friendly Gardens that was about stormwater management. And since permaculture very much is about the utilization, the utilization of resources that are on site, water is obviously a considerable one of those. And um, so many of the practices that we are already implementing um, very much dovetailed and, and fit the metrics that they had for, quote, ocean friendly gardens. And so we've been able to forge a partnership um, but just this year, we'll be continuing again in its second, third year second or so. Second-ish year. Second -ish year. Yeah. Um, and so we're looking forward to having uh, more bi-monthly blitzes with, with them. OK, thank you. Thank you both for showing up. And <laughs> Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's been fun. And um, um, I'll see you. Uh, we hope to see you at the course. At the course. <laughs> All right, sounds good.